I know you're dealing with a lot. Just thank you for that because so many things have changed uh, and it's probably the biggest professional uh, challenge that any of us have faced uh, or experienced in our lifetimes. Uh, but the dedication and determination and grit uh, that uh, you guys have shown uh, is, in, is unbelievable to our staff and every department who has worked tirelessly to get us where we're at. I just want to thank you again, parents and students. Uh, you truly are appreciated and are incredible. Uh, and I know that uh, we will be back at, at school soon. Looks like uh, the, the again that the director of Department of Health will talk about the numbers uh, and so forth. So uh, again, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time, uh, but uh, on on myself or or talking because we have some just some great uh, distinguished guests uh, today who will provide us with uh, just some updates uh, and insights about uh, what's going on in our community. And as a county, so as all of you know, we have our superintendent county, uh, San Bernardino County of Schools, uh, Mr. Ted Alejandre, with us today. We're also going to have uh, our San Bernardino County Director of Public Health, uh, Mr. Corwin Porter, and uh, from Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, Dr. Troy Pennington. So we're really honored to have them today. And once we hear from them. Uh, and they do their presentations. We also have a distinguished panel from our district, from uh, our, our CGSD district uh, made up of our leadership team to share an update of where Colton's at and some of the key areas that we're focusing on. Uh, and so the, we, I will moderate some questions and ask them some really tough questions. And, and they, I've told them they got to they gotta be ready for that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we also uh, always want to highlight our students. So we are going to have a segment in our community cabinet uh, today, like we always do, that highlights our student voice, because that's so important. Uh, our why is obviously the service to our students. So uh, so for the third portion of our agenda this morning, we'll hear from Mirza Martinez uh, from Mental Health Systems, who will share a video highlighting the efforts of our CJSD students. Uh, who have been working in the community, the Colton community, uh, which is the Colton Community Coalition for Change. Uh, it's a youth that has really worked hard to safeguard the health of our community. I've seen the video, it's, a, it's just amazing. You guys are gonna love it out there and I'm just so proud of the work that they, they've done. So uh, thank you so much to uh, all our guests today. Again, so, uh, we will get started with our first keynote speaker, and I'll just quickly introduce uh, 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 our keynote speaker, Ted Alejandre. Uh, and so he is uh, our county superintendent. Uh, and so Mr. Alejandre began his four year term as the county's 34th superintendent after being elected in office in June 2014. He began his second four year term in January 2019. As County Superintendent, Mr. Alejandre works collaboratively with educators, families, other agencies, and stakeholders to provide advocacy, leadership, and services for and on behalf of the 407,000 K-12 uh, students in our, uh, in our county and attending public schools uh, in this awesome county. So I am proud and to um, introduce and turn it over to uh, Mr. Ted Alejandre at this Time. Good morning, Ted. Good morning, Dr. Miranda, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to your incredible community. And thank you, Board President Haro, members of the board, for all of your leadership in serving the Colton community. You really have been a model of how to engage stakeholders in our county. Uh, the community cabinet that's here today and over the prior years has really been key to the success of encouraging community members to participate in the decisions to support all students. And when the stakeholder requirement, uh, stakeholder engagement requirement became part of the local control accountability plan for the state, it was so great to uh, to pr uh, promote what Colton was doing to the entire county because you truly are a model in the way that you really engage parents and other stakeholders. So congratulations and thank you for everything you do. I'd just like to share a few words of what's taking place across San Bernardino County 
in uh, reopening public schools in the age of COVID. As Dr. Miranda mentioned, it was only a few months ago back in March where we had to close schools. And at that time we thought, okay, a couple of weeks uh, because we didn't know the extent of the virus. And then we knew it was gonna be a little bit longer. So we extended the closure, uh, hoping to get kids back before the end of the year, particularly for our seniors and others that had special events like graduations, et cetera. And then we knew that this virus wasn't gonna go away. So we had to close it for the duration of the year, but really want to commend Colton and others for acknowledging and recognizing graduating seniors in the way they did to really give them that special recognition that they missed uh, not having a traditional graduation. They still went out of their way to make it special for all students. And so now as we came into this year where most districts are planning to have kids back, the virus continued to expand. And uh, because of the uh, state direction and not allowing in-person schools until this virus starts to get contained, uh, all of our districts started the year uh, with a distance learning model and the state issued guidance on what that model should include. And so we'll go over some of that today. I'll, I'll kind of go through a brief uh, because I know there's two other incredible speakers. So if we go to the next slide, we'll just start off. And so when you look at uh, the framework and guidance, so the state did issue that um, in terms of how districts were to open up. And so we do have all of our districts again in distance learning with the exception of one district out in the high desert that uh, was able to receive a waiver uh, from the state and our county department of public health for in-person instruction. Uh, their transmission rates are very low. And so uh, they did open in person in, in a hybrid model where they have cohorts of students coming on separate days. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, the requirements in place for on-campus reopening. First, the health and safety. And I have to tell you, you're going to be listening to our public health uh, director, uh, Mr. Corbin Porter. He's done a tremendous job and been a huge collaborator with our superintendents and really uh, providing leadership so that our superintendents can really protect staff and students in maintaining health and safety for all students. And then the instructional program, we'll go to a slide that kind of gives a little bit of a summary of what the state expectations are. You know, we did this in March. It was the first time we ever did it. And uh, now there's many more requirements. And so in these new requirements for the state, um, you have to have access for students. There has to be live interaction, challenging assignments. And I won't go through all of the list, but really there has to be a continued a success for all students. Uh, close to the bottom, you'll see learning continuity attendance plan. Uh, that is in place of the yearly LCAP the districts have done. And there's still an important part for parent and stakeholder engagement, which Colton and others have really emphasized. So we'll go to the next slide and talk about distance learning because uh, distance learning is something again that we just started and what was so important is really to collaborate with all of our districts across our county so we can leverage resources and utilize uh, technology learning platforms that are engaging for students. So in our county website, you'll see in the very front page distance learning support and there's uh, some incredible supports there for teachers and for parents and for districts. Uh, we have our distance learning resource hub. Uh, we also established a learning collaborative that's really throughout the state where we in Kern County and others are taking a leadership approach and utilizing resources with the California Collaborative on Ex Educational Excellence. Um, we started a partnership with uh, Riverside County and uh, KBCR so that the daily programming that takes place on KBCR where you don't need internet connectivity because this is telecast, all of those programs are tied to K-12 standards. And then with content experts from county schools and from districts like Colton and others, we're able to really embed learning opportunities through work-based learning, through other types of online activities and hands-on activities that tie to that program and so students can connect. And then with the Alliance for Education, our SB Connect and NEPRIS, we've invited our industry partners to really have their experts come online to engage in students in these instructions and talk about what their industry is doing and what potential opportunities there are for the future and also how they're adjusting to COVID to ensure their businesses continue to move forward. And then as you see on the screen, our footsteps to brilliance, we upgraded the product that's available at no cost to every parent in the entire county. Uh, that's a partnership between county schools, um, first of five, and also San Rio County Department of Preschool Services, a children's fund as well, where we put together our resources to really have this incredible literacy platform. Uh, Dr. Miranda talked about literacy being a key theme. Uh, we encourage all parents to go on to our website, have access to this for our preschool students. If your students use this platform every day, they will be much more ready for TK and K programs. 
because the content is so valuable. It's been tested by teachers who have many years of experience teaching kindergarten, first grade, and they think it's just an outstanding opportunity for parents to have access to this at no cost. So if we go to the next slide. We'll continue. And uh, PPE, you know, it obviously, uh, and Dr. Porter uh, can mention this and that PP is so important to make sure that staff and students have access to this. Uh, Cal OES um, had a huge shipment that was going out to the entire state. Uh, the state funded that so the districts would have an initial supply of PP. Uh, they didn't actually, though, have a way to get it to districts uh, that was simple. And so they reached out to county offices and we agreed to take all the PPE for all of our 33 districts, 400,000 students in our warehouse. And all that PP came in over several shipments. And once we got it in, we worked with Colton and the other districts to make sure that we had masks for students, facial uh, coverings for students, shields for teacher, hand sanitizer, and also no, uh, no touch thermometer so that we can make sure schools were supplied with PPE. And Dr. Miranda and his board has gone above and beyond that in making sure they have additional equipment for the community and students and staff at Colton. So that's important. We go to the next slide. We can um, talk about the Im impact of students. And uh, what I really appreciate with Colton and others is that they've really embedded student voice into a countywide platform. So when we do these live, which we normally do, last year, the last ending part of it, we had to do it remotely because of COVID. And we're gonna continue this year in a remote environment to start, but we really get input from all of our students across our county. Uh, they get to mix up with kids. So Colton kids will be with Chino and Fontana and Apple Valley and Big Bear and other districts that participate. So we can really have a reflective voice of the entire community in addressing community vital signs that are so important for our county to be the best place to live, work and play. And so students get to pick their areas and then they do research and interviews and come with their recommendations and present them to elected leaders where these elected leaders are just fascinated at the ideas that our young people have. And those ideas are important to include in our platform and Colton School Board has taken a leadership role in including those recommendations and how they provide support to all of their students in the district. So just appreciate student voice as a key part of this process. Next slide. And I mentioned the Alliance for Education uh, this summer. Uh, the Alliance is really a partnership with businesses and industry leaders and other elements throughout our county uh, to really provide students with opportunities to extend their career thoughts and ambitions. And uh, this summer we had a virtual program, uh, Medical Leaders of Tomorrow, that's a partnership with the Alliance and with the IEP and with UCR to have students attend live at UCR, uh, their Medical Leaders of Tomorrow program. It's an incredible one week program, extremely immersive. Uh, because of COVID, we had to do it online, but we had 27 students from Colton and they had their final presentations on a Saturday afternoon a few weeks back. I had the opportunity to listen to all the presentation and just fascinated at how much effort that our students put into it. And it really reminds you that when you have an area that students are really interested in, they will go through the school day and beyond and on weekends and other times because they really want to learn something they're interested about. And when our young people see the opportunities for the future and what they can do for themselves and their families and, and really engage, uh, it's just wonderful to see the ambition that they have. And so this was a wonderful experience and just appreciate Colton's involvement in that. Next slide, please. And then we talk about family and community engagement. We will at the county level have a uh, event for all community and family members throughout the county for dates are listed on the slide. Uh, we encourage people to participate. It will be distance uh, learning in terms of the involvement. We usually have it in place, but because of COVID, we'll have in that manner. But really, this is just an extension of providing opportunities for parents and others to really explore how they can support their students and really be leaders in their own communities so they can get other parents to participate. And uh, when we have these events, we always tap into Colton's expertise. Uh, because again, the model that you have with the community cabinet is really something that we promote throughout the entire county and uh, working together, we can really make an incredible opportunity for all of our parents uh, throughout San Bernardino County. So save those dates and we hope you participate in them and we can go to the next slide. And uh, which is a closing slide. But again, I just want to thank all of you for being online today. I want to thank you for the opportunity. Again, the guests you have and just want to else also remind uh, everyone how important it is to follow the guidance of county public health 
Uh, they've been incredible leaders in this process. And again, once we follow them and promote it to others, we can keep our communities safe and hopefully end this virus and get back to normal and continue to do what we wanna do for all of the students that we serve. So thank you, Dr. Miranda, for your leadership in Colton. And again, thank you for inviting me on the program. Thank you, Ted. I uh, really appreciate you joining us this morning. You've always supported our, our district and, and the vision, the mission, and you for your leadership as county superintendent, uh, just uh, guiding us through these uh, challenging times is, uh, you know, we meet regularly uh, with the 33 other superintendents and uh, it's always uh, much appreciated. Again, thank you for your, what you guys do at the county. There's no way that we could do the work without that support. So thank you again. Uh, just awesome information. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is uh, we're just uh, again just so uh, happy that we we're able to uh, ask uh, our the uh, director of San Marino County Department of Health, Mr. Cohen Porter. Uh, we've had many dialogues in the past about the health and safety of our not only our students but our our employees. So really excited to have him here with us. And so just a little bio about Mr. Porter here. Uh, he has worked with the public health uh, or with public health for over 31 years. Uh, he was previously the assistant director for the San Bernardino County Department of Health uh, for almost five years with oversight of over four divisions and three programs. So Mr. Porter is a registered environmental health specialist with California and with the National Environmental Health Association. He's also an adjunct professor at Loma Linda University uh, School of Public Health. So uh, we're excited to have uh, Mr. Porter here with us. Uh, Corwin, I will let you uh, take over at this point. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be a part of a collaborative effort and to be able to talk about some very specific areas that I think are of great interest to Colton and, and all of you that are, are listening in today. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about some high level data and then I'll move into some more specifics around Colton and some of the, the challenges that you're facing and some of the efforts that public health is engaged in. Next slide, please, thank you. So this particular slide here is just representative of the tests that occur per day within our county. There's a green line that you see uh, crossing the screen, that's the, the goal that the state has set for every jurisdiction in the state. So we have met it um, a significant amount of the time in the last month or two, but you see as of late, we've had a few dips below that line. So we need in the county to increase the number of folks that are receiving testing. Next slide, please. This slide shows the number of cases that are reported each day for positive COVID individuals within the county. We had a large peak that we saw uh, at, toward the middle and end of July. Now that has started to decrease, which is good news. And I'm gonna talk about more specifics on that in the, in the next few slides, but we're starting to trend in the right direction as far as the number of positive individuals we're seeing in our county. Next slide, please. This is actually the epidemi epidemiologic curve that we use and, and look at in our, our county. There's a light green bar at the very top of the dark green bar that you see that represents cases that are related to outbreaks. Early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a much higher percentage of outbreaks occurring in skilled nursing facilities and other congregate settings. As time has gone on, you can see that massive peak that we experienced uh, toward the latter part of July. And the bulk of those cases were all community driven cases. They were coming out of out of folks transmitting the, the virus outside of congregate settings. So um, there's just a lot of community spread that has occurred. You'll see that the, the bars are starting to get smaller, which is good news for us. So we're, we're trying our best to keep that trend going in the right direction. Next slide, please. This particular slide shows some of the findings from our contact tracing efforts in the county. What we're seeing is the largest number of folks 
that are COVID positive are in our 18 to 34 age bracket. You'll see that's followed by uh, the next age, older age group, and then on the way down. So the age group that uh, we're dealing with in the schools transect a little bit of the, the lower end of that 18 to 34 age group. Uh, the 17 year olds do have a, a much higher transmission rate than the elementary school kids per se. The other thing that we're seeing is asymptomatic spread. If you take a look um, at that bar, you will see that those with symptoms are in that reddish color and those that uh, um, are asymptomatic are blue at the bottom. We see a high number of asymptomatic folks still. Approximately 10% of the folks that are COVID positive do not have symptoms or referred to as asymptomatic. The other thing that we're seeing, those individuals that are contacted by our contact tracers that indicated they, they got out of their house or they, they invited some folks over to their house to get together, that many of the gatherings are actually associated with family uh, type, even close friend type gatherings. And that's a lot of the transmission that we're seeing is happening in those types of settings. So our message is continuing to be, please, do not gather, do not uh, expose others to the virus or yourself. Uh, and then um, you'll see a little bit more breakdown on, on, on the, the tables there about some other spread um, that we've identified in those types of settings with gatherings. Next slide, please. The state is monitoring the county for a variety of metrics. The ones I'm gonna talk about today are the first two, the case rate and the uh, positivity. So what the state is holding the county responsible for is the case rate per 100,000. So that's basically how many cases of COVID positive folks that we have, and they run a seven day average to see what that rate is. Now, since this slide was created, I have positive news. Our rate has descended from the 190 uh, area there, the 192, um, or actually 191.3 down to 177. So we're making positive improvement just over even the last couple of days since this slide was created. Our positivity is the other thing the state is looking at. So out of the number of folks tested, how many of those were positive for COVID-19? The state wants us to be below 8%. We are currently at 10.4, which is another positive indicator. We've come down uh, from 10.6 over the last couple of days. So until we can get our case rate below 100 cases per 100,000 and our positivity below 8%, we will stay on the state's monitoring list, which comes with restrictions for certain business activities, certain indoor activities that you've probably heard about. But until we come off the monitoring list, some of our businesses must remain closed. Schools will need to stay in distance learning. And there's other, other aspects to being on this monitoring list. But we are trending in a positive direction. Next slide, please. So I wanted to point you to where you might be able to find some of the data that I refer to. So on our COVID, it's basically our svcovid19.com website. At the opening page, you'll see on the far left, the cities listed uh, at the upper margin of this slide. Under the cities tab there, we actually have a couple data sets that we have posted. We do this every week. It's a 14 day running case rate. So, what you'll see is all the cities and communities in the county listed by their case rate as well as their positivity. Next slide, please. So for Colton specifically, the case rate is coming in around 340 per 100,000. Again, the objective is to be below 100. Your positivity on the far right side of that slide is at 15.3%. Again, the state is asking us to be below 8%. So we have some work to do in your community to reduce the virus spread currently. 
The good news is, though, is last week's report showed you over 400 cases per 100,000. So you are starting to trend down, which is good news. And we're hoping that with our collaborative work together, we can see that continue to descend and get those numbers shrink. Next slide, please. For um, school districts, on that same page on the far left, if you scroll down to where it says schools, then scroll down within that page, we actually list a variety of reports that we provide that are, have school specific data. Next slide, please. So the most recent report that we created basically shows some information um, overall for the Colton Unified School District. And um, so you can take a look at that. Next slide, please. More specifically, we create a report that goes into the 14 day case rate because that's what the state is, is holding us accountable to. And then you can look and see how your school district uh, shapes up versus uh, what the state metric is. And so you can see that you're coming in at 401. So still a little high there and there's some work to be done before uh, we can return to the classroom. But all these data sets are available for the public to view. The, this current slide that you're looking at basically shows how many cases that uh, we see in children within your district. And so just another piece of information that we wanted to provide for reference as you make decisions. Next slide, please. So testing is a, is a, is a big topic. And it's actually a metric that the, the school districts have been uh, asked to meet when they bring students back. They're requested to t uh, basically test 100% of their staff within a two month period. So testing opportunities are available throughout the community on our COVID-19 website. We have um, basically a location there on the front page that talks to where people can get tested. And so whether it be family, uh, friends, school district employees, they are also able to access these services and go to these sites for testing. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more information uh, that I'll briefly talk about on testing. There's a lot of misconception out there about what testing is. Um, when we started out, we had a very long swab that we used that uh, people described as being inserted far enough to touch their brain. We have since switched to just a, a much shorter swab that goes just into the, uh, beyond the opening of, the, of the, the nose into the nares, and it's swabbed in there. It's not invasive anymore. The testing is quick. It's painless now. And so we're trying to get that message out so that people can get tested without fear. And the results are actually coming in. We've had reports that they have received, people have received reports or their testing results back within 24 hours. Um, we say three to five days so that no one's overly disappointed, but typically we're seeing results back within 48 hours. So very good news on the testing front. Next slide, please. One other topic that has been important uh, in the county and with school districts is contact tracing. And so in your plans that you uh, have developed, there should be a, a contact tracing component that's being included. So this slide is simply just to address that uh, um, contact tracing doesn't have to be overwhelming. There's some basic steps to it. And this slide describes that where we're really just trying to find out who is COVID positive and who have they come in contact with that should also either go into isolation or quarantine so we can stop the spread of the virus. Next slide, please. This is just another helpful handout that I wanted to just show to you that we've made available That's, that walks through some of those basic steps to, to contact tracing. We have made this available to all the school districts and we will continue to provide additional information as needed, but we thought we would provide this just as a simple way to understand a little bit about that contact tracing process and then what happens um, 
to those who are, are, are positive or are exposed. Next slide, please. So in our county, as I've mentioned, there's the website address on the right side of this slide. We have a hotline also that if you have questions or concerns, we have a team of folks that work daily to answer calls and questions from the community. And as Dr. Miranda mentioned, we have regular calls uh, between um, the superintendent of schools, Mr. Alejandre, his office, the county superintendent, uh, superintendents of, of the various districts to make sure that we are able to communicate openly and, and answer questions and understand what the needs are and, and try to meet all those needs that, that the school districts are experiencing. This is unlike anything they've had to deal with in the past. And so very unique, which requires a lot of work, a lot of communication to solve the issues. Next slide, please. So that comes, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I simply wanted to say thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this opportunity. And I, I can't shut up yet until I say, please make sure you're physically distancing, make sure you're wearing your face covering and adhering to all the requirements that'll keep us safe and get us off the uh, state's monitoring list so we can return the county to normal business. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Corwin, uh, for your leadership in this area. Uh, you know, we've had like a, we we talked about many conversations. You've reported to our superintendents without your this great information. There's no way that we'd be able to figure things out. So again, uh, just uh, just great information for those people out there. And for us, uh, we're learning more and more, and and really uh, that that information is really critical for us for our decision making. So so thanks again. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, being here this morning. Uh, and updating our community uh, in terms of where the uh, county uh, Department of Health is at. So we're going to move on uh, to our next speaker this morning. Uh, and again, another distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Troy Pennington, who is at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, which is right next to us, right next to Colton. So, uh, so Dr. Uh, Pennington received his doctor. Uh, of osteo osteopathic medicine degree from Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona in 2000. Dr. Pennington did a rotating internship at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center after graduation and completed his residency at University of California, Los Angeles program at Kern Medical Center in Bakersfield, where he also served as chief resident of emergency medicine. He finished the residency in 2004 and joined ARMC later that year as a faculty member of the first osteopathic emergency medicine residency in California. Dr. Pennington, uh, Pennington excuse me, has since become an integral part of the ARMC team and is now an emergency room physician who is uh, double board certified right, in emergency medicine and emergency medical services. So, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pennington, um, for being here this morning. I know we, we, you have a presentation, so I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miranda. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to uh, be able to take this opportunity to give everyone a little look kind of under the hood or behind the scenes of what's been happening in our county since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, what many of you may not know is that you know, our county was really one of the first places in the entire United States that had any interaction with anyone that had or was suspected to have coronavirus. Um, you know, this first slide here, you know, the first that I got involved was actually as early as January, believe it or not. On January 26th, it was a Sunday, I received a phone call at home and it was a high level official at the state of California from the EMS authority. And they basically had told me that you know, there's this, hey, there's this mysterious, you know, virus in China and um, a bunch of American citizens that we're evacuating, around 200 of them. We're gonna fly them from Wuhan and we're gonna bring them into Ontario Airport. Many of you may not know that Ontario Airport is designed as a repatriation center, meaning for people that are in war-torn areas or disasters anywhere around the world, if they're American citizens, it's one of those key locations that we bring people to repatriate or to bring them back into the States. Um, and I was told that we had 200 
coming in, I was asked to put together a medical team because they wanted to quarantine all 200 of these individuals. And this was the first time in more than 50 years that any quarantine of this size was to be attempted. I quickly pointed back to them and said, are you sure you want to quarantine them in an airport? You know, that airport hangar is not, you know, really, it's a common space with common bathrooms. And they said, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. They're coming to Ontario Airport and they're going to be here tomorrow, get a team together. And I'm like, oh my God. So, you know, that transpired very quickly. Thankfully, that didn't happen. The team didn't show up. And I quickly had flashbacks of, you know, what this slide is from the pandemic of uh, 1918. I quickly was thinking about, um, you know, those old slides I saw of people from a pandemic stacked up in a warehouse and was having visions of that happening in our county. But thankfully, what we were able to do is we were able to redirect them and we were able to bring these individuals uh, to March Air Force Base after several discussions. And thankfully, that plane didn't land until Wednesday. We were able to partner with uh, the team at Riverside County Hospital, and they were quickly able to assemble um, a, essentially a mobile health clinic. And those shots that are there are my first night working there in the quarantine. So, you know, at the end of that week in January, and the beginning of February, I was working on that very first quarantine in the United States with a team from Arrowhead and a team in, in partnership with Riverside County. And they did a fantastic job. Next slide, please. Um, this is us, you know, setting up, you know, for the first day of the, you know, one of the, for me working at the quarantine, trying to figure out a workflow, we were setting things together inside um, of uh, the, uh, the tent and some of the other areas on the campus of March Air Force Base. And, you know, what we were doing is we were trying to find a way to take care of those individuals. Thankfully, that first quarantine in the U.S. went without incident. It went very quickly. And, you know, that first two weeks and that first group that we had, we didn't have a single positive people that got sick, but nobody that actually had COVID. Uh, that was followed by several flights throughout California to other Air Force bases. And then they would also take periodically people from the airports that were trying to sneak back in and they would quarantine them at March as well. Now, February and March come and go and we're starting to see cases popping up uh, in the community. And I was quickly frightened by what, you know, I felt was a lack of communication in the hospitals. I come from a fire service background. I was a fireman paramedic before I was a physician. And the fire departments in San Bernardino County, all 26 of them came together under a unified command. And I really felt like that's what needed to happen with the hospitals. And so what the hospitals ended up doing was we formed these regional hospital teams. And we divided the hospital teams up into sections of uh, the county. Um, so we had kind of an east end and a west end and a mountain section. And we put specific groups of hospitals together to try to work together as a team. We also began organizing the data. Can you back up a couple of slides? Sorry, guys. Um, there we go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so we, we organized the West End, the desert, and the East Valley and mountains into um, our areas of the community. And we designated lead physicians at each one of these um, uh, hospitals. And we started the hospitals communicating together, um, all pushing that information to a one set database. So we could actually track how many people we had in the hospital countywide. The hospitals weren't really good at talking with each other. Next slide, please. On the other side of it, um, what happened at the hospitals was emergency room providers are very quick to adapt. So we started modifying equipment. That's actually a picture of myself. And we were trying to find ways to minimize respiratory droplets during intubation, which is that procedure where you put someone to sleep and you put them on a ventilator. But we were actually working with a group of physicians and um, some engineers from JPL that were creating these little plexiglass shields to try to protect us. You can see that the staff, you know, quickly, next slide, please. The staff quickly started to adapt to this and they were, you know, changing their workflows in the emergency department. They were moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, and they rapidly were assimilating and figuring out what we were going to do. Now, this slide may look very frightening. And frankly, it's frightening to me. This wasn't from the pandemic of 1918. This is just from a couple of months ago. This is National Orange Show. This was our first county alternate care site that we began to set up. 
when we looked at the initial predictions from the worldwide experts on what to expect and how many patients, if you roll the clock back to March, it was absolutely frightening. They were telling us that potentially we were looking at thousands of patients and exponential growth in the community. And so the county, in, in our group working with the county to try to set up you know, supplies for this, we were purchasing supplies, obviously we're purchasing cots and medical supplies, we're setting up staffing plans. This was one of our first attempts to do that. We actually were starting to set up the National Orange Show as a place to evacuate people to if the hospitals became overwhelmed. Thankfully, the, that didn't happen. And we do have alternate care sites still kind of at the warm ready right now throughout the county. And we actually have a tent city built on the campus of Arrowhead. If we get overwhelmed at the hospital. The other thing that was going on early on in the pandemic is we found that the majority of the people initially that were dying were those that were vulnerable. That vulnerable population was those that are in our skilled nursing facilities. We partnered with public health and we used some of our um, team from the emergency department at Arrowhead and we formed these SOS teams to go out to those skilled nursing facilities and provide them with equipment and supplies and training to prevent those individuals from getting sick and prevent them from ending up in the hospitals as the hospitals were becoming overwhelmed. Next slide, please. And what, here's where we're at today. We did a really good job with those SOS teams in you know, preventing people from ending up in the hospital. There's over 171 teams throughout uh, our, our county. We've been to all of those facilities at least once, some of them two, three, even four times. This is what we look like as of yesterday. Now, this is hospital data. All of the hospitals are reporting their cases to each other. So the black represents patients that have COVID that are hospitalized somewhere in San Bernardino County at one of our county hospitals. Um, whether that's Loma Linda or Arrowhead or Kaiser, that represents a patient in a hospital. The coral represents a patient that we also is a patient under investigation, but we don't have the test back yet. So all of these represent patients that are hospitalized. Now, if you look back on to uh, like April 15th, which was our prior peak, you can see at that time that we had a little over 300 people that were in the hospital that we thought had COVID. And then it flattened out a little bit through May. And what happened was then towards the end of May, and then you can see in the beginning of June, as we started to attempt to reopen and people were burnt out on COVID, what happened? All of a sudden our numbers started to spike. And you can see, and Corwin kind of already um, you know, referred to this earlier, we had that big spike in July. This, you know, on July 24th, we peaked. We had just about 750 hospitalized patients uh, throughout all of our hospitals. So some of your bigger hospitals like Arrowhead or Loma Linda or San Antonio or, or Kaiser Fontana, some of those hospitals had up to 100 or more COVID patients in the hospital that were that sick. Now, thankfully, that's declined and you'll follow that curve going down. And where we were yesterday is we had 402 patients still hospitalized throughout the county. Now you'll notice there's a yellow and a red line there. Those were our alert and our action line um, so that we're still above where we feel comfortable because this is normally the lightest time of the year for hospitals and we're still overwhelmed with the number of COVID patients and I'm still a little bit fearful of what's gonna happen when we get into flu season. Next slide, please. This slide is a little bit more granular look and anybody that's interested, I can you know, send you out a copy of the slide deck. It just gives you the specific numbers on which individual days. So it's our past 30 day kind of rolling averages, but you'll see that the trend is promising. Next slide, please. Um, this also looks at the ventilator use. So all of the hospitals again are talking to each other. It's been relatively flat. We have seen an increase in the use of ventilators in the past couple of weeks, but for the most part, the black is patients that are sick enough to be on a ventilator or a breathing machine and the core are ventilators that are available. Thankfully, we've had you know several hundred, somewhere between three to 500 ventilators available throughout the pandemic so far. Next slide, please. Uh, the pandemic took a weird turn for me and I just wanted to share with you a little personal story of what happened with our own family. You know, many of you probably have had experience with a friend or a family member at this point that has been infected. But if you go backwards to May, that wasn't true for everyone. And I always thought that there was a very good likelihood that I was going to get sick, but I never expected that it would be my wife. Um, you know, right after May, May 11th, my wife said, yeah, I feel a little tired. I don't feel good. 
Tuesday on the 12th, she told me she thought she had a fever. We checked her temperature a couple of times that day, nothing. She still felt a little off and, you know, I said, am I okay? I'm going to go to work. And she said, sure. And so I went off to work that day at around 3.30. Next slide, please. I, yes, I got this explicative laced uh, text back from my wife. I bleeped it out for you, but she basically sent me this, you know, I didn't get it at work because the text didn't come through. So it was after 10 o'clock, I'm driving home and I look down at my text and I'm like, uh, and the text shows that she's having a fever. And um, when I called her, she was coughing and she was so short of breath that she was having difficulty just talking to me in casual conversation. Next slide, please. And for those of you that think you're healthy, I mean, my wife's 31. She runs five to seven miles a day. She has no pre-existing medical problems. She does, you know, aerial kind of acrobatics. She does the silks. Um, she's not a cigarette smoker. She had no reason to get this sick. And it's very quickly, next slide, please. What happened was within the next 30 to 48 hours, her oxygen levels went to the point where she couldn't walk to the bathroom by herself. Her oxygen levels dropped from perfect at 100% down into the 80s, and I had to end up taking her to the hospital. My work life began to look like my home life. Next slide, please. And within a couple of days, now she's ICU at Arrowhead, and she's short of breath in simple conversation. Um, she's on oxygen at that point, 40 or more liters per minute. If you think of a normal home cannula, it usually only runs at one to six liters. Um, I'm in a unique position because I do disaster medicine and, and I run very large teams and she was miserable there and I was miserable without her. We had ruled out all the other bad stuff. We knew that she had COVID. And at this point, you know, it was a matter of, I wanted to try to take, you know, as a home health provider at home. Next slide, please. So believe it or not, I was able to bring her home and I set up literally an ICU in the bedroom. I had oxygen concentrators. I had IV poles. We kept her on antibiotics because we still didn't really know at this point whether or not um, she was going to need them. We still were struggling with what's the best protocol. We hadn't even proven if steroids definitively worked or not. But we were like this now for a period of several days. Next slide, please. Um, well, this was meant to be a video, but I don't think it's going to work. But I, the point here was that my wife was so short of breath. Now, here at home, she was on 26 liters of oxygen per minute. She couldn't breathe sitting up or lying on her side. She had to lie face down on the bed just to be able to get a breath because there's more of your lung exposed when you're lying face down. That persisted. She was sick from the 12th, sick enough to be hospitalized from around the 12th all the way through the 28th, 16 days of really horrible illness and someone that was otherwise perfectly healthy. So it's just a little cautionary piece for all of you just for you to understand that um, it's so very important, you know, to follow all of those precautions that Corwin was just recommending. Uh, last slide, please. Um, the pandemic is not over. Um, social distancing are important. Wearing a mask, washing your hands. Every time we let our guard down, we see those numbers spike back up in the community, and then it takes us several weeks to get it back under control. Um, you know, I really want to encourage you guys to, you know, be smart out there, be safe, be good to each other and make sure that you're masking and distancing and washing and be very cautious. But I wanted to thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And, and we'll be happy to answer any questions here later on. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Pennington, uh, for that great information, that update, and just being uh, personal, authentic about how it affected your personal life. Uh, just incredible story. And we're so happy to hear that she's doing, uh, I'm sure, fine now and, and healthy. So. Uh, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, we, we're we going to just, uh, again, just thank you to the keynote speakers, uh, Ted, uh, Corwin, and, and Dr. Pennington. Again, thank you uh, just for, for joining us. Uh, so we're going to transition into our expert panel here at our district. So I, I'm just excited uh, in, to just introduce, we have our Assistant Super Student Services, Amanda Corden, uh, Rick Jensen, he's our Assistant Super Business Services and Operations. Uh, Dr. Peterson, she's our Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. And, and then uh, Eric and Ciso, uh, who leads our Nutrition Services as Director. And last but not certainly not least, uh, our Chief Technology Officer, Mr. Shane Pinnell. All these people have been working uh, tirelessly 
uh, just doing a phenomenal job of leading our district through these uh, difficult, challenging times. So I, I do have uh, some questions. I know that we do, uh, we're short on some time, so I'm not gonna put you guys through the grinder on all the questions, but certainly the community is really interested in listening, hearing from um, some of our leadership here about what's going on with uh, the, the pandemic, the resources are available uh, in some of our instructional programs. So I, I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Peterson. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, I know parents out there are wondering what are the available uh, schooling options that exist right now? For, uh, if you don't mind taking that uh, question, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to be here today and to um, have a chance to talk about this. And so, um, really, you know, we presented this before the school year started, and and we are now entering our, I believe, our fourth week of school at this point. Um, today makes the start of the fourth week. And so really we have three um, main options available for the majority of our students. And so most of our students are in what we call our, our uh, hybrid distance learning model. And we start for those students, we started the year in distance learning. And then at some point when it is safe to do so, uh, we will be uh, moving into um, a hybrid 50-50 model um, if, if we, at that point again, assuming it's safe to do so. And so um, in that scenario, um, students are, have been put into two cohorts as we um, put them into our system our, into our uh, student information system this year, cohort A and cohort B. And what that will look like is cohort A will go to go to school two days during the week. Cohort B will go to two, go to school two days during the week. Um, so like a Monday, Tuesday for cohort A. Thursday, Friday for cohort B, and then the rest, the remaining time will be um, spent in distance learning. And, and so what this allows is the opportunity for that um, in, in person interaction with teachers, in person interaction with students, and, and hopefully we'll um, hopefully we'll get to get to that point um, as soon as we can. And so the second option um, is was basically to stay um, distance learning for the year and or for the semester and and so for those students for elementary we have basically what's called full-time distance learning and so the student um they will stay with that their current teacher that they have through the through the through the course of the year or semester um and continue as other students are going back to school they'll stay in distance learning during during that time and and so this was the option for our students that um, may either have had, had a health risk, health risk or family has a health risk or something of that, that nature. And so our third choice, and then this was for our, for our secondary, the third choice or the, the distance learning choice for our secondary um, for the full year or full semester is the facilitated online learning. And that is an online program basically supporting the learning of our students with with uh, so our students are with one teacher using the odyssey Wear program um, the program takes them through their studies and the teachers there for support um, to provide steps along the way to support their testing and to um, support them getting through um, the program and, and providing help as needed and so those are basically our three um, three main options for schooling at this point um, throughout the district Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that uh, the update and that explanation to the community. Uh, so, uh, Shane, Mr. Pinnell, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, you know, the question of access and accessibility uh, and for devices. So, I, I know we're doing a lot of work in this and you guys have done an incredible job, but I'm sure the community wants to hear about what is being done to ensure that uh, all students have access to the devices and the internet? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, so in the in the spring when COVID hit us and we decided to go with full distance learning uh, to deal with that, we were fortunate in CJUSD that we had already made um, significant investments in devices for students. Uh, those, of course, were being used in the classroom. So we were able to very quickly, uh, through, through a great deal of effort from everybody um, at the school sites and in the IT department at the district office to 
take those out of carts in the classrooms and prep them for distribution for students at home. And then they then, of course, kept those devices over the summer and they've now returned to school with that device that they received in the spring. And then any of our new students have been able to go to school to get um, to get a device that they need. We do have some challenges around internet access and we've um, we've worked very closely with our county office. Uh, I'd like to thank David Thurston from the county office for for helping us um, secure some additional hotspots. Um, we had purchased 2,500 hotspots uh, through T-Mobile's and Power Ed program. We had done that prior to COVID. Uh, so we were able to utilize those during the spring and, and we're utilizing those now. There are some challenges with hotspots, of course. Um, they, they are not the fastest or, or the best solution to getting internet access into the home, but it is the solution that we have available to us and it's the, it's the way that we can get it out quickly. Um, we've also purchased additional hotspots um, through uh, through T-Mobile also, and, that, and that's funded through some COVID funds and another program through the state and through the County Office of Education as well, or Superintendent of Schools, sorry. Um, so, so we do have these devices available. They are, the hotspots are in limited quantity. So if you have internet access at home, we, you know, we, we recommend that you use that. Um, if you're able to secure internet access into your home, please, please do so. And there are, um, on our website, there are, is um, a section on our website for uh, reduced cost internet access at home. The best internet access you can get is coming through a wire into your house. So if you're able to secure that, please do so. We do have hotspots available in a limited quantity. Um, and, and again, they, they aren't the best option, but it is, it is a good option until we can get, um, hopefully get everybody, uh, all of our students connected via a wire at some point, but that's going to take a lot of time. Oh, thanks, uh, Shane, for that great information. I know you, that your team has worked uh, tirelessly since March to try to get everybody devices, connectivity. Uh, and so they uh, they truly is here to support all of you in the community uh, with all those uh, needs. So thank you. Oh, and, and Dr. Miranda, can I make yes. one more Thanks. mention about access? Uh, we also do have support access. If you're having an issue, please reach out to your teacher first. Um, if your teacher's not able to solve your problem, she'll be able to point you or your student in the right direction. We do have staff that are available to assist students. Um, uh, so we do have that resource available and your teachers, teachers have access to that information. It's, it's great information. Thanks Shane, for, uh, for uh, bringing that up. Uh, I think it's important that they know where to go to, right? Uh, let's see. So, uh, you know, it's really important. Uh, we, I think in the district, we very from the get go, we talked about. Uh, just uh, providing the, the the nutritious meals, and so uh, we have Rick and and Eric and CISO that uh, are here that will. Uh, I like to ask them this question about, uh, you know, what are we doing to ensure that students receive nutritious meals uh, during this time? Uh, I know that you guys are doing a great job with that, and and, and uh, how are we able to provide these free meals to students? So. Uh, so I'm going to throw that at you, uh, Rick and, and Eric, uh, if you guys uh, can um, answer that. I know there's, I think you, you have a presentation on that. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. Um, and Eric is not available right now. I'm going to uh, okay. take the baton and uh, run with it. So he, he gave me the information that I need to present today. So uh, if you want to indulge me for a moment, I'll take a couple of minutes and run through these slides for you. Uh, next slide, please. So currently we are serving at nine school sites in uh, certain key areas of the of the district. That includes DRC, Cooley Ranch, Grant, Wilson, Rogers, Lincoln, Joe Baca Middle, Grand Terrace High, and Bloomington High. Next slide. We are, ser we are serving students with two different teams at each site. So we have 18 different teams and they alternate every week. This is for redundancy in case one team is exposed to the virus, then we can put that team out while another team takes over and we do not stop serving students. We have acrylic shields throughout the serving areas to separate the workers from the public and face masks and face shields are available for staff to, to wear. They are required to wear at least the face masks and face masks are also required for visitors. We have hand sanitizers available as the students and parents walk in and they are uh, asked to keep their six foot distances from each other. Next slide. The maintenance crews have been 
awesome uh, working with us in developing and building these uh, plastic shields that uh, further increase the distance between staff and the public to further help uh, increase uh, social distancing, but also barriers between everybody to uh, reduce the spread of the coronavirus. Next slide. So sometimes we have to make changes on the fly and Eric and his staff did this over at Bloomington High School. So sometimes we just have to make changes rather quickly uh, when something's just not working out the way that we think it should. So at Bloomington High School, we redirected the traffic around the school to the front and set up in one of the classrooms to serve the students. So it's at a shorter distance and uh, it just worked out much better this way. Next slide. We also encourage social distancing uh, as we get ready for school and as uh, people come onto campus and if they have to line up at all, then we wanna make sure that they have a way to separate each other in six foot distances. And here you can see that maintenance came up with a stencil that they could actually paint on the ground for those lines. Next slide. Currently we are serving cold or frozen food that can be taken home and reheated. This allows us to uh, serve a meal, breakfast and lunch in one day, but we're also looking to the future, being able to serve multiple meals at a time. Now, unlike summer, when we were able to serve all students under the age of 18 under the seamless summer program, we are now, that, that waiver for serving under that program is no longer in effect. So we must serve only Colton Joint Unified School District students. So point of service devices are used at every site to, uh, for the students to input their name or their number, if they remember it, uh, to uh, gather this information. Next slide, please. So currently we have a challenge throughout the state because we are serving maybe 10 to 5% of the number of meals that we normally serve during the day, during the normal program. So without these meal numbers, we're not able to generate the revenue to pay for all the costs of the program. Uh, we, we need to continue to employ our food service employees uh, based on rules regarding the uh, federal funding that we receive. So uh, it's important to understand as, well, why are students not coming? Why are we only serving a thousand meals a day? So we need to reach out to try and increase our participation in these meals. So one of these ideas is to increase capacity by serving at every site. We could use buses to del deliver out to the community or perhaps serve several meals at a time. Now we have challenges to each of these ideas that we need to overcome and we need to make plans for how to do that. I just wanna make sure the community understands we're doing everything in our power to try to do everything we can to reach out to the community and make sure everybody has nutritious meals. Next slide. So one of the things I'm proud to uh, say on behalf of Eric, and he's done a lot of work on this, is we have been accepted for the Community Eligibility Program. It's a federal program that allows all students to eat for free. This is breakfast and lunch. So this provides a better opportunity and even a greater incentive for families who uh, may have been on reduced or full price meal uh, uh, status to come to school and eat breakfast and lunch every day. And we would encourage everybody to do so. Whether they, th they think that they are uh, eligible or not, doesn't matter anymore, everybody's eligible. So we encourage everybody to come to school, get a nutritious lunch and breakfast. And, uh, and if you have any ideas, if you have any suggestions, how we can improve, be sure to let us know. Next slide. I think that's it for me. Oh, Thank you for your time. Thanks, thanks Rick. Thanks for that, uh, uh, just, uh, or, uh, orientation about our food service and just uh, and and director uh, and uh, Eric and Ciso for uh, just providing the meals and his team. They've done a great job. So uh, one more question, uh, and this I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Amanda Corden to uh, help us out here. Uh, as everybody knows, this is a stressful time for everyone, uh, and our so they're definitely virtual. Uh, all, there are definitely social and emotional uh, resources out there for our students. So can you tell us, uh, Ms. Corden, what those uh, resources are and how can our community access those? Sure thing. Um, thank you for having me today, Dr. Miranda, and welcome to our community cabinet members. 
We're doing several things in the area of social emotional um, servicing both staff and students, knowing that this is a time of high levels of anxiety and stress and we're looking at ways that we can address that so that we can optimize the learning environment for students and also the teaching environment for teachers. So we have a fantastic mental health program. They've been working diligently along with our amazing counseling K through 12 counselors have been working really hard at, at coming up with different ways to develop these social emotional supports. So we actually will have a mental health hotline that will go live next week that will be accessible to students or staff and will be monitored. Um, on an ongoing basis for those immediate um, levels of intervention and support. We uh, are in the process, our mental health manager is in the process yesterday and today, as a matter of fact, of training 36 new mental health interns to uh, provide service to our school district. And so they're working really hard to have, you know, to be able to have the skills necessarily to provide that support. We, um, as a student service mental health um, partnership, have design or have designated Wednesdays as wellness Wednesdays. And so we will provide different uh, activities and workshops both for staff and students. For example, last Wednesday and this Wednesday, we had um, presentations in the morning and in the afternoon to help staff deal with the um, managing their stress and dealing with the anxiety of COVID-19. And so I'm hearing that those presentations or workshops have gone off really well. We had a lot of staff sign up for that. So I'm really excited that we were able to provide that support for them. And we will continue every Wednesday to provide learning opportunities and resources that they can share and help to monitor their students as well. So um, keep on the lookout for those Wellness Wednesday activities. Um, at the elementary level, our counselors are working hard. They're de um, delivering SEL lessons to the students inside the classroom. They're working with their teachers to be able to divide the or to deliver those SEL lessons in the classroom. They are, um, they've done a fantastic job of transitioning their famous empowerment program into a virtual learning um, process. They will be starting those empowerment um, activities soon. So keep, be on the lookout for that. Many of them have developed um, their own Google classrooms and they're providing resources to the students on their sites. There is a centralized Google site that, that has been developed with resources for staffing counselors. Um, to be able to pull from to help support SEL in their own classrooms as well. And many have developed a direct access link so that students or staff can access them directly if they need immediate attention with regards to well being or social emotional support. At the secondary level, um, the counselors are very much targeting their high risk students right now. We had several students that were referred to our mental health program last year that they are making sure to follow up with so that we don't lose track of these students and we continue um, the services that we have been providing for those students. And so they also are um, developing uh, counselor corners, what they're calling counselor corners on their, their site web sites. And so people are able to access resources through that. Grand Terrace High School, kudos, they developed a wellness center this year and they have staffed it with a mental health um, person full time. And so they're utilizing that virtually to provide services to students. And um, Colton High is in the process of developing their wellness center as well. As a district, we are working on uh, developing extended learning opportunities for social emotional, meaning um, tutoring, if you will, in social emotional or extra support after school hours and on Saturdays. So keep an eye out for that. And then our mental health department is continuing with its tiered referral process. So they are accepting referrals. They have several referrals already submitted to them by the school sites. Counselors and administrators have submitted mental health referrals, and they will continue to provide services to those students and families, um, not only in the mental health area, but in the social services um, area. We do have, in addition to mental health interns, I believe we have four what we call case management interns, and those focus on a more of linkage to services, maybe not necessarily mental health, but uh, other social support services. So that's what we've got a lot going on in our division, and we're working hard. We know that SEL is just the highest uh, priority right now and making sure that students and staff are well. And so that is our priority. Well, thank you, um, Amanda. Thank you to your team uh, for, as you said, it's a priority for the district, uh, taking care of uh, the social emotional learning piece, the wellness piece. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, the panel. Uh, I could ask you on and on questions. 
Uh, we got to move into our student voice piece and our community piece. So thank you all of you for uh, being here and, and updating the community out there of what's going on in Colton. Uh, and I'm sure that they appreciate that uh, the, the, the information and everything we're doing as a team to ensure that our students are provided for the safety, the meals, the, uh, the instruction, which is critical. And so, and th thank you to all of those, all your teams there too. So we're going to transition now to our community voice. Uh, and so, I want to take this time to introduce uh, a longtime community cabinet member, uh, Mirza Martinez from MHA Central Valley Prevention, who will highlight the wonderful work of a, a group of recent uh, CJSD graduates, our 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 own. Uh, and current CG students who are part of the Colton Community Coalition for Change Youth. These students work with mental health systems to help pass a tobacco retail license ordinance, stopping sales of vaping, tobacco products to minors in Colton. They have been recognized at numerous community events, such as the San Marino Valley College Escape, the, uh, the vape event, and are working with San Marino County schools on their tobacco use prevention education programs. Because of their work, the American Lung Association recognized Colton in their 2020 report as one of the two cities in the entire Inland Empire as a city on the rise. Mirza, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, I wanna make sure my mic is on. I believe it is. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, for this amazing opportunity to tell a story, a community, very inspiring community stories. It's, it's nice to see all the work that's being done uh, around the time, this crucial time under COVID-19 conditions. Uh, my name for everybody else, I, I will repeat, is Mir Sandrata Martinez. I am a prevention specialist, um, Central Valley Prevention Program, a program of mental health systems. And our job is to work with community, all sectors of the community, to try to evaluate, to try to study, to try to observe what are the conditions at the environmental uh, level that are uh, creating high accessibility to, um, you know, underage uh, drinking, smoking, and other drug use. So, um, unfortunately, the bad news is, is, is that under COVID-19 conditions, we've lost uh, a lot of our partners, in, our, our important partners in the process of identifying kids at risk. Uh, kids don't see their coaches anymore. They're not uh, in a physical environment where they can get caught uh, using, uh, you know, vaping products or, or in, in that early stage uh, experimenting with drugs because the school system does that for us. It tries to keep them safe. It tries to identify them early and it tries to provide interventions so that we don't get to the stage of uh, addiction. So uh, it's, it's become, you know, a, a little disheartening to see how these numbers are going up, you know, what if a kid gets uh, caught vaping in a closet? You know, um, you know, parents don't know what to do. Uh, there's a lot more reports of kids obtaining and just having access to different substances that are out there. The markets are inundated with products that the kids have access to now. And we're seeing this, uh, you know, epidemic of vaping just escalating at disproportionate, in, you know, rate. So this is why it's so important for us uh, uh, to have as our ally community members and students who outside of their schoolwork decide that they want to participate or do community service with programs like ours. Uh, they get to really do field work uh, they expressed their concerns, and in 2017, they brought this issue up to the table during a, um, a coalition meeting. Their concern was that they knew that there were a lot of sales to minors of tobacco products and baby products in their city. So the coalition voted to really look into it and, and see how we can uh, evaluate, assess the situation. They uh, they have been on board 
for for the three years this project ha has taken. And um, three out of, of the six students have actually been members of the coalition since 2010. I cannot do justice, you know, to the work that they've done. I can't say enough about them. I can't, um, I can't begin to tell you how many times they came after a long, uh, you know, day of school, how many meetings they had to attend, how many speaking engagements, you know, the courage they had to put themselves out there, you know, doing the not popular thing to do. Um, so we tried to put this video together for community to see uh, for them to tell their own story, uh, for us to sit here and, and, and watch and just enjoy their own testimony, their own words and their own work. So, um, you know, they did an amazing job. We want to share that with the community. We look forward to continuing con communication with the school district to see how we can continue our services under these new conditions. I, I will be shooting an email to Amanda um, to see how we can continue the efforts. But this is an amazing story for everyone to enjoy. I think that um, the youth had, have done a wonderful job at taking this issue that affects ger their generation, just taking ownership of it and really, really going out there and, and, um, and just doing the work that was required to do for such a long time. And I also want to say, you know, big thank you to our local government uh, representatives that were so open to the conversation and receptive to the information that the students had to share. So with that, you know, we'll let the video roll and have them tell their story. Thank you, and please give me just a minute to get the video going. Thank you. Hi, my name is Axel Vasquez. I'm a member of the Colton Coalition. I'm also a football player for the Freshman Football Team. I play defensive end and my back. And for that position, you need to learn how to take care of your ground. And I took that into the coalition and learned how to take care of what I need to do. There was a time in middle school where I was into all this mess. Like I thought smoking and hanging with the wrong people was cool. It came to a time where I got in trouble for hanging with these people. And throughout the time, my siblings introduced me into a group called the coalition. In this group, I learned how to take care of myself and the people around me. I also learned how to avoid all these people for doing something better. I also joined football over the summer to do something better and not worse. The Colton Coalition made an event called Escape the Vape at San Bernardino Valley College. The event was a huge success, and throughout the two years I was working with the Coalition on a project to pass a TRL in our city of Colton. Throughout the hard work and all the success that we passed, we finally passed the TRL in our city of Colton. I enjoyed making this video and thank you for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. My name is Kevin Hernandez Rosales. I am a senior in Colton High School. I do cross country, soccer, and track. I love making new friends. New friends is great, it's a great feeling. But what is tough is keeping those friends. I go to school every single day. I never got absent. I never had a bad attendance. Seeing my, my friends and other teens using flavored tobacco is just hard to see. Seeing teens in my school going to restrooms 
back of the classroom, or even in the streets. I remember getting offered flavored tobacco, and it sucks because it became normal in this kind of age. But seeing my friends doing those kind of things made me think that I could do better, that I want to be in a much better path. Running is something I do very single day, every single day. Running is an adventure for me. Running is my only way of relieving stress, getting away from those negative things. Running makes me feel more relaxed. I've been part of the Colton Coalition for years now, and I've been learning a lot of new things. And what I've learned, that it doesn't just take one person to make a change. It takes a whole community, a city, a family, to make a change in our coaching coalition. At the moment, I'm coaching soccer for the kids. And I'm actually very happy because they see me as a, as a role model, as a leader. And that's what the coaching coalition has taught me, to become a leader and how to make those negative things into positive. To always be a worker, hard worker, and to never give up. The city of Colton has passed a TRL on a project that we've been working on for years. And that shows that with hard work and dedication, anything is possible. Hello, my name is Audrey Vasquez Rosales. I am a seventh grader. I go to Colson Middle School and I enjoy playing basketball and I am hoping to be in the team very soon. The one thing I'm doing right now is being a part of a part of the Colson Coalition for Change and I really enjoy being part of all this. And I want to be a photographer when I grow up. I want to have my own business for photos. And a time when I was in school, I was just minding my own business. And I, I hung out with this group of people, of boys and girls, and we used to get in a lot of trouble. Not not me, but usually them. I try to stay out of it so I won't get in trouble. And one day, my friend, she told me that, oh, let's go bathe and things like that. I'm like, but like, I thought they were just joking around. So I was like, uh huh. Um, but I never, I used to never answer. So, and one day, I got a text while I was in class and it was the girl, she's like, oh, come to the bathroom. And I was like, um, okay. And then I went, and then I just see a group of girls vaping, and they invited me. At a moment, I said, I was thinking in my head, what should I do? Do the right thing or don't do it, or do the wrong thing? And I did the right thing. I told him that I'm not like that and I don't want to do it. And sh you guys shouldn't be doing this either. And they, I started being like, I started ignoring them. And I'm like, I don't want to be a part of this. And then, I, and now I'm not friends with them, which makes it sad. But it's better for me to not be friends with people like that. My advice to anyone that's dealing with this should tell an adult. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. My name is Madison, I'm 16 years old, and I like to do makeup, 
spend time with my family, and give back to my community. What? What is girl? Wow, like just being yourself. Be yourself, that's pretty much it. Well, you know, there was one time where I was at a kickback with a group friend, and all my friends just kept asking me, like, oh, do you want a baby? Come on, just take a hit. And I just kept refusing it. Because that's just something I don't do. I just like it. Well, if it doesn't work, I just basically get up, ignore them, don't talk to them, probably end up leaving. Just ignore them. Get them silently. So I was 10, and I was seven years old, and I went. Just one time, I just went with my grandma to this coalition meeting, and I think I just kind of enjoyed it. I don't know. One time, it just got me into it, started going all the time, and from all of me, just taught me how to say, no, that's not good for you. They say it's not how bad it is, the consequences, and all that. It's just, that's where I learned. If I were to give some advice, advice to someone that was in my situation, I'd pretty much just say, put your foot down. Think of what the consequences are, what the situation could be that you end up. There's a lot of reasons. Just put your foot down, say no, do what I think is best for you. Dr. Andrew, I think the video is a little too jumpy. Okay, I'll let that go. Sorry about sorry about that. That was me. Uh, sorry, I think the video is a little too jumpy, but we can share the link to it um, okay. both in the chat here, and then we can also um, post it on the website for the event as well. Um, I I uh, we can try to play it. I think um, there's a presentation attached to it uh, that I think would be really uh, important and meaningful to share. Uh, would you like us to try to share it? See if it just goes. Uh, just the presentation part of it. The the are you saying in the video there, Mirza? Yes, we have we have the file. Uh, we can try to play it from our end and uh, start where the presentation starts and see if it works better that way. Yeah, we can give that a, a, a chance. Let me, let me make you the presenter real quick, Mirza. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry about that, everybody out there. I know that uh, trying to get the video going is challenging. So, yes, Dr. Miranda uh, Mears is going to be um, presenting a slideshow, so she's the presenter now. So, I think she just okay. give her a second to pull that up, and then uh, we'll be able to run through that. Okay, got gotcha. you. Hi, my name is Axel Vasquez. I'm a member. Okay, we will fast forward. Um, I think right before. Okay, let's start. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Mirza, we can, oh, there we go. We can see your screen now. Thank you. Currently 17 years old and I live in the city of Ponce. I'm doing this video to really just talk about myself and my own experiences in my life. All of those things that we are doing now, just to 
Uh, you're not able to hear it? it it's uh it's choppy so it's not gonna it's not gonna come through uh smoothly so it cuts off and back and forth so yeah we, we yeah we can we can share the link to the community cabinet uh and i think the, the community cabinet got to see the community got to see the essence of it and some of those phenomenal stories i got to see it uh, last night and just the stories are unbelievable. The work that you're doing with the, the our students, our graduates, and our current students is unbelievable. Uh, and and to hear the student voices, I mean, you work with them, uh, and what they've done to put this together uh, is pretty incredible and motivating and inspiring. Uh, they, yeah. When I again, when I saw the videos, I said I was showing to my wife. I said, "Wow, look at this! Look at what our students are doing." uh and and so so we can share the link um uh did you did you did you want to add anything else Mirza? yes i i think that i think uh, you're on mute oh let's see there you're good you're good now to, uh, mm -hmm. to view uh the story uh i think that um one of the big takeaways for me is uh, just seeing how these students have grown. You know, the sometimes, you know, when they come, you know, they ask us, do you want, do you want us to clean the windows? Do you want us to take the trash out? Um, and, you know, I, I will forever be surprised that, you know, that is what they perceive as community service, that they think that, you know, that is the, the thing that they, they can do. Our job is to identify, you know, you know, give them time, talk to them, and see, you know, where they are, what the gift, gifts and talents are. And the other part of it, of it is just, you know, giving the, them an opportunity to explore the field of public health and behavioral health in a way that they're sometimes not prepared to do. And, and always very surprised, pleasantly surprised to know that they're actually going to get access to a workstation, that they're actually going to be learning about assessment data collection, um, that they're going to be evaluating data, that we're, they're going to have speaking engagement opportunities. You know, there, there's so much. But with this particular project, I want to say that they were the ones that did bring the issue up about sales to minors in the city they knew it was happening they had the courage to bring it up and they were willing to do the work to bring it to the attention of the elected officials it was a project that has been standing for over three years they showed up for meetings they showed up to city council meetings uh we did this uh, uh in collaboration with the local tobacco control programs in collaboration with Colton PD, there were minor decoy operations involved. We can't just, we, I think they learned the value of data and data collection. We can't just show up to city council meeting and say, this is our opinion and we don't have any information behind it. We don't have any proof. So um, it's been a wonderful experience to work with them and, and to see how passionate they really were about trying to save their friends from this epidemic and informing people. They were really concerned uh, about uh, most of the time conversations they have with their friends and nobody knows what's in a vape. Uh, even adults don't know what's in a vape. So the the work that they did is amazing. Uh, they, during COVID-19, they, they continued the work. Uh, the, the tobacco retail license uh, now is a local law and it's very difficult to help pass laws. Uh, now there's a regulation for these products and now there are rules for tobacco retailers. Now they have to apply for a license to sell tobacco and um, just like they have to do with alcohol. Um, this is an amazing uh, policy development experience for them. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was so crucial and I know they were commended several times by city council members on the courage they had to really, you know, put themselves out there and fight for, for this cause. Uh, two students were, three students were selected to actually attend a big conference in Sacramento 
They spoke to Senator Kanyeva about the issue. There is a big movement to try to regulate this pro this product at state level. And uh, right now, there, there's a group of students that uh, from Copeland Union Park School District that have been selected as part of uh, the San Bernardino uh, Advisory com uh, Committee to try to pass a, a countywide tobacco retail license. So uh, Colton was recognized as a city on the rise by the uh, American Lung Association uh, uh, report in 2020, and that's a huge deal. Only two cities in the entire county, Adelanto and Colton, uh, have taken measures to really regulate and reduce accessibility to youth to flavored tobacco, which is, you know, a big problem in, in our state and in our cities, and it's really devastating our communities very early on with kids as young as elementary school, you know, having access and and, and vaping. So. Thank you. I don't do justice to the story, but I hope that they can go and and really view this PowerPoint and um, and we're forever looking for students that want to come and and help out with the environmental prevention programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mirza, for your leadership, your mentoring, uh, and everything you're doing with our youth. Uh, it, it's very inspiring. Uh, and again, uh, out there, we're going to share the link. Uh, watch the videos. They're they're so amazing. Uh, you're right. We didn't give it justice today, but our students are doing amazing things, and they're making a difference. And and really, it's good perspective for us as leaders that why uh, we do the things we do is because the students the, uh, for our students. So, uh, anyway, so thank you again. Uh, we are going to move into the last portion of our uh, community cabinet, which is our call to action. And and this is something that we've put in uh, for every community cabinet. Uh, and so I'm going to start uh, off, uh, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Pennington to uh, invite him, give us some tips, uh, uh, and what we can do to stop the spread. Even though he shared that, but my call to action really is: uh, I'm going to keep it simple. It's really uh, again uh, the you know, the three W's. Uh, just, you know, we're still in this pandemic, uh, so we want people to stay safe. So make sure that you're wearing your masks, your face coverings. Uh, you're also, uh, that you're waiting six feet apart. And last but not least is washing your hands. Uh, as a former elementary school principal, boy, I used to high five the kids and, and, you know, uh, all day long, and I'd always wash my hands 10, 20 times. Uh, it was so fun. It's uh, but always washing your hands. Uh, it's important. So, so my call to action is just to continue follow the again the California Department of Health guidelines and CDC and the and our local uh, San Bernardino County Department uh, health lines and stay safe. So, uh, Dr. Pennington. Uh, uh, do would you mind uh, just giving us uh, your call to action and giving us some giving us some tips uh, what we can do to can uh, to stay safe? And are we still there? Are you still there, Doctor Pennington? Maybe. Rick, I don't see Doctor Pennington on the list of it. Um, He's still I'm sorry. He, so he so he went sorry, off. Frank. Okay. Yeah. Right. How about you, Corwin? Can it? How about you? Can I ask you to maybe uh, give us uh, some tips? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. We really need to make sure we're doing our due diligence. We're seeing good trending right now in our numbers, but we're not there yet. We really need to follow this all the way through to make sure we can get to the finish line and get below what the state metrics are dictating. So along with washing the hands, wearing your face coverings, physically distancing, please be careful of your environment. Make sure you're not around others. You may have to turn down a few social engagements, a few things like that. We just ask everyone to do their part for a little longer. Once we come off this state monitoring list, then those, those restrictions will also go away. We, so we just have to hold the course a little longer 
and, and be strict in our adherence to the guidelines. But thank you all for your efforts and thank you for starting to bend the numbers down in your community. Great, those are great words. Uh, thank you, Corwin. Dr. Uh, Dr. Miranda, I believe uh, Mr. Pennington is on again. Okay, Dr. Pennington. Can you hear us? I think you're on mute right now. You want to take him off mute, Shane? I'm trying. Doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to be working. Let me try this one too. Okay, no worries. Let's see if he shows up. All right. Doesn't look like it's working. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Pennington. Uh, uh, apologize for that uh, technical difficulty. But so, uh, just want to uh, wrap it up and and in our community cabinet uh, again. Uh, we just want to thank all our guest speakers. Uh, what a great job! Great information from our county superintendent of schools, our director of public health here in the county, and and Dr. Pennington from Arrowhead Medical Center, who is in the uh, trenches, if you will, and and just. Just amazing. Our CJC panel, thank you for the, your leadership and today answering some questions. Uh, uh, just so important that the community knows that we're work, working hard at this. And then our, our student voice and community voice, uh, incredible work that Minnesota is doing with our students. Uh, they're making a difference and just is inspiring. Uh, so it just makes us uh, work even harder. Uh, so just collectively, uh, thank you to all the community leaders out there, uh, the, all the constituents of the Board of Education. We couldn't do the work. And I know it's, there's some board members who participate from other districts who are listening today. Thank you for your leadership too in your districts, because uh, we're all in this together. Uh, nobody's alone. Uh, we're, we're, we're all, I'll say it again, we're all in this together. And together we're gonna uh, make a difference uh, so continue to wear your mask, continue to physically distance, wash your hands, listen to the experts. And again, together, we're going to make a lasting impact on our community and make a difference for, for our children. So uh, to all of you, have a great uh, afternoon and uh, thank you again. So we are done. <laughs>